Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October webinar for the Ascolite Televisors Network. I'm Colin Simpson. And today we are looking at all things multimedia and digital. Actually, let me just start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. But yeah, so we're looking at uh, all things multimedia. We've got a little bit of stuff about AI in teaching. We've got some stuff about 3D dinosaurs. Um, I think this should be a really fun session. I'm really looking forward to this. But I'm going to hand over now to Carmen. Let me just uh, introduce her. Uh, where are we? So Carmen is at, Carmen Ballas is an educational developer and researcher at the University of Sydney Business School. Her work and research combines education, digital technologies, creative writing and practice. She's Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and Associate Editor at um, Educational Technology at the Journal of University Teaching and Learning Practice. And she spends way too much time on her laptop. <laughs> so over to you, Carmen. Okay, thank you so much for the invite. Can everybody see my screen and hear me okay? Yep, awesome. Okay, so uh, teleadvisors, I'm assuming that everybody's pretty tech savvy in the room, but I will just ask, uh, does everybody actually know what a deep fake is? I'm guessing a lot of people do, but I can't sort of see. So what's the general consens consensus? Everybody knows what a deep fake is. I mean, it's been a lot in the news, right? And it's been a, a lot of discussion around deep fakes. When I presented this... It comes up, that may be just... Um, okay, so, yeah. So when I pre uh, presented on this a couple of weeks ago, there were some people who were not quite sure. So I, I figure in these cases, it's always better to show rather than tell. So here's um, Deep Tom. Righty. Yep. Your okay, so I always do that bit where, you know, it goes around because I think it's funny. Um, but if you don't know Deep Tom and you don't know Deep Fakes, that's totally generated by an algorithm. It's not Tom and it's fairly realistic. And you've probably heard in the media, you know, so news items that have been faked and so on. And I do show that to start off with because what we are doing in this little project of ours is we're not actually trying to deep fake lecturers. <laughs> so I just want to sort of get that right out of the way straight away. Um, we were, we are experimenting with AI avatars as guest lecturers or guest presenters in business and using a similar technology but we're not actually trying to trick students or to trick anybody to 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 um to go down that road really we're actually trying to provoke deep questions so boyd is very integral to this process boyd britton our media manager and also john buchanan who's the uh, subject matter expert on this project so i'll just run you through a few things about it uh, first, I'll talk about why we did this AI avatar project. I mean, it is a nice shiny technology, but we did actually have a kind of educational reason behind that. I'll talk about what we did, and I do have some extra notes at the end if people have a you know particular kind of uh, process questions around the technicalities of it. And we'll also talk about what students said about it. And I guess... It's just to acknowledge here that John Buchanan and Denny Gosman, the, the INF 6018 unit coordinators, were very much involved in this process. And John Buchanan in particular is a bit of an expert on ethics in business intelligence. And so that really guided the whole project. Before I sort of talk more about why we, we used an AI avatar in this particular week, uh, we actually used it in one week of this unit that was on uh, business ethics and algorithmic uh, integrity, algorithmic ethics, and, you know, all of that topic. 
So before I do that, actually, I'll just show you our, or our avatar and she can explain in a nutshell why we did this. We're living in a world where new data and new information systems are emerging all the time. We can and should use data and information systems to inform our analysis and make decisions. Yeah, so we really think it's important that um, students know about how data and information inform our decisions and how that can be embodied in different ways. So here's another reason why, I guess, um, how many of you heard about Michaela? Michaela? Maybe some, maybe not all. So Michaela's a virtual influencer and I prepared this just before. She's actually quite fascinating if, if you do want to follow her on Instagram. As you can see there, she's um, one of the 25 most influential people on the internet, although she's not actually a person. Uh, she's a really huge brand influencer, um, marketing force, sells a lot of makeup and clothes, although obviously she's got no face or body to put them on. And she's a really big force. And I'm saying she, but of course it's an algorithm. Uh, and it's it, there's some very clever content around that. So I, I recommend checking that out if you want to sort of look more about how that is unfolding in the commercial world at the moment. And it is really very uh, influential in the commercial world at the moment. There's a lot happening in that space. The technology is just getting better and better all the time. So we kind of really felt like it was a very important for students not only to sort of tell them actually that this is important, but to show them and immerse them in that technology, almost as like consumers in a way of that technology and to explore the business and ethical implications that might fall out from that. Um, because often, I guess for all of us, we're using AI all the time without knowing it and sometimes quite uncritically. And it's only when you are actually sort of um, forced to, to see it and to engage with it that perhaps you sort of think more deeply about it. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about the what and the how. There were really a lot of people that helped create this experience. And I will just sort of talk more about the educational side of things, but please do you know, throw in the questions and at the end I'll do my best to answer them. Um, one of the things that we concentrated on a lot was actually getting the scripts right before we put it in the software. So what we did essentially was we worked very closely with the academics to get a very sort of tight script, a meaningful script, and to feed that text into a software that generated an avatar. I mean, that's in essence what we did. And a lot of the work was actually in scripting and, and the production after the post-production rather than the generating of the AI avatar was actually quite easy. So one of the key things we did um, was link in with the expertise in the business school. Uh, this project does sort of follow on from some previous experimentation with 2D avatars. And if you want to know more about the context of that project, I really highly recommend this blog post where it goes into some detail and there's some emails that you can follow up there as well. And we are lucky in the business school, we are on the fifth floor of a building and on the fourth floor, there's Motus Lab. And I don't know if any of you are sort of AI fans, if you know about Motus Lab and Mike Seymour, he's quite well renowned in the film industry. And he works with quite sophisticated technology. He does really cutting edge stuff in um, neural rendering technology in RT. And he, his um, research is all around digital humans and interaction with digital humans. So obviously Mike Seymour is a uh, you know, renowned expert in this field and is quite cutting edge and far more sophisticated than what we wanted to do in this little project. But it was really useful to link in with him and, and talk about the project. He's very much concerned with the ethical implications of AI as well but also the amazing potential 
of AI. Um, so he put us onto a software called Synthesia, and that was sort of a useful tip, and that's what we use for the project, essentially. So we spent a lot of time making Isabella less creepy. Uh, that's a lot of what we did, actually, because uh, it was it was really important to make the scripts very clear. Of course, it's an algorithm, doesn't know when to pause. Um, Isabella, we had to put commas in very unusual places to sort of trick the algorithm to make it more, more natural sounding. So the sound was really key. Um, Boyd and worked very hard on that, on that side of things. The other thing we did, and I, I've shown this screenshot because it sort of exemplifies some of the things that we came across in the post-production, is that when you're using an algorithm, of course, there's no emotion or understanding of context behind that. So at one point in, in the script, John Buchanan had described this terrible oil disaster and the actually quite unethical responses to it. And was unpacking those business kind of implications and it was quite a serious uh, a serious subject and I think at one point uh, the script went something like and the village was drowned or something and she was you know well, the village was flooded and she was smiling like this yes and hundreds of people died you know so obviously in the post-production I said oh look can we overlay something over the top it's, it's really creepy that she's talking about disaster and smiling like that um so there were sort of some unexpected kind of hiccups around using an AI generated presenter in that sense because we were mainly using piece to camera and so that raised really interesting ethical implications for us because um, why are we actually trying to make a sound more natural? Is that actually an ethical thing to do? We're trying to make it less creepy, but actually it's just an avatar, you know. So that was an interesting process for ourselves, actually. Um, Isabella was never referred to as Isabella. That's just our internal name for her. <laughs> She was always referred to in the um, Canvas module as an AI presenter. And uh, you can see on the screenshot on the first one that there's John Buchanan and there's an introductory video where he really clearly says this is an AI presenter, an avatar. This is why we're going to use Isabella. No, he doesn't say Isabella. This is why we're using an AI avatar. Avatar. These are the kind of ethical uh, matters that we have to consider, et cetera, et cetera. And then as you can see in the other screenshot, every time that um, Isabella came on screen, referred to as an AI presenter. So we were very explicit and very clear in our own mind that we were not trying to trick students into thinking that this was a real person or a real academic or a real lecturer. That was really not our purpose. And so um this unit is actually within the context of uh, a framework a learning design framework based around Gibbs reflective cycle so it was really much about exposing students to this avatar giving activities around that such as uh I can show you perhaps in a minute uh for example after the AI presenter went through the particular topic, there would be an activity underneath saying, okay, this AI avatar was created with Synthesia software. Now go to Synthesia to their ethics and privacy policy and comment below on anything that makes that makes you feel uncomfortable or not, or do you think it's okay? Um, please kind of think about and reflect about the privacy implications for that. And if you were leading a business yourself, um, what kind of questions might you ask? Uh, what would be important to know about using an AI avatar? Because, of course, you know, we've all been exposed to lots of chatbots, uh, text chatbots, uh, less so the kind of uh, these ones, the embodied ones, but I think that's probably 
going to be the future for many of us is that we're going to be interacting with avatars. So, yeah, so we did pose it very much within that context of activity, reflection, and to encourage students to think very critically about what we were presenting to them, actually. So if I just... Um, so we did two focus groups after that. And there's a little thank you down there to my colleagues, Dewa and Steph, who ran those focus groups. And it was quite interesting what students had to say about these AI avatars. So here we go. Some of the feedback was that students actually wanted them more lifelike. It, it couldn't be human enough. <laughs> so as you see, we had avatar, we had the avatar mainly from sort of like the shoulders up. So Isabella was a bit static. Usually when presenting, there's a lot more movement and a lot more range in the voice and, and so on. So that was obviously a big deal. It could get very monotone if you had that avatar for the whole time. And students went straight there. They wanted more personalised avatars. Why can't I choose my own um, gender, my own accent, my own language, wouldn't that be cool? And we said, yeah, absolutely. That would be really, really super interesting. We didn't have the technology, but that personalization is a direction that students want to go in. And talking avatars. Um, one student said, wouldn't it be great if I could choose my mum as the avatar and I could talk to her about my learning and ask her questions? You know, so that was quite fun as well. And genuinely students wanted to have an avatar that they could interact with and if, if the people in the room that know a bit about AI yes conversational agents um, cognitive agents that really is a thing in AI but again this was very much uh, a pres AI as presenter although students really keen on that some preferred sort of a real teacher um in this, particularly in the sense where they thought if there was a question they had, then who would they ask? So this, this issue of data provenance or knowing where the content came from came up. Uh, that was a bit unsettling for some people to know who was behind the avatar. Others had, sort of were like, man, you know, I don't care. That's fine with me if it's an avatar or not an avatar, which was interesting as well. And some thought Isabella was real. Despite all of those cues, um, I think we're all kind of distracted at times or don't read everything carefully or skim over things, busy times of year, lots of, lots of reasons. But there were genuinely some students who were really surprised in the focus groups that um, Isabella was uh, not real. And they were impressed when they found out that Isabella was not real. So there were kind of things that were unexpected and other things we did expect. So obviously what type of videos should we be creating with AI avatars? There's, uh, we saw that amazing presentation with virtual field trips and so on, I mean, how you would combine that combine that with AI avatars, not sure, but definitely things like if you're doing a demonstration of a formula, you might prefer to do a pen cast, etc. And it really highlighted to us this idea that we probably rely on video too much anyway. Um, why video? Could it be a reading? Could it be more activity? Maybe we should get away from presenting content so much. Uh, the, the transparency and the ethical kind of concerns were there because students didn't always realise it was an AI avatar. And for me as an educational developer, this was a super important question about the whole, the direction of AI and automation in education. So I'm just going to show you a, a really brief snippet of another software that I just Googled and found pretty quickly. And it took me 10 minutes to make, honestly. It was not uh, a big effort. It's not as sophisticated as Isabella. There hasn't been any post-production or amazing stuff um, done to it. But I'll give you an idea about how accessible this technology is becoming. 
Teachers and students should help design and develop AI avatars. We should lead this new technology. Let's not be led by ed tech companies. Yeah, so that was my thing. It, I, I thought it was so easy that we should just really get in there, you know. Um, I think we can use AI a lot more creatively and critically than is currently happening. So, and I just put a few little examples in there about this idea of AI literacy. There's the, the screenshot in there is from the unit where we actually directed students to the software company and said, you know, pull it apart, pick it up, tell us what you think. And I, the barcode there, that's just a site, it's actually for elementary uh, kids in the States, but it has some really nice links in there and a nice kind of learning sequence for students to engage with AI in a very kind of low low tech, low states, fun way. And I think that's um, a really good way to get to terms with AI without it being sort of some mystique, uh, strange, amazing technology. It, it's, it's probably helpful just to engage with it. So that's it from me, I think. Thank you. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen unless anybody wants to see anything else and questions that was wonderful thank you carmen lots of discussion i think about the idea of creepiness and the uncanny uncanny valley um i think particularly and i, I think that's absolutely one of the biggest challenges because there's still a degree of separation from the way these people are speaking and, and the expressiveness of their faces or whatever I actually saw a video this morning um because you know the the whole idea of the uncanny valley is that there's something there's some visceral reaction that we have in us when something looks human but not quite human and mm -hmm. you know that sort of raises this question of like oh where did this actually come from for this to be an evolutionary survival thing and one of the theories was that maybe it actually comes from the time when homo sapiens were coexisting with neanderthals and you know other mm sort of humans anyway but that, that was just something i found really interesting theory. interesting theory i mean it's uh it was interesting for us that students just wanted it more natural more human like mm, um, mm. yeah so it's probably because it's actually better to listen to or to watch it might be sort of from a pure kind of content consumption point of view as well yeah yeah you're not as conscious of it being artificial and then that's kind of what jacob has asked there is whether there was a sense from the students that they were more weirded out by the voice or the visual. Was there any comment on that? Yeah, absolutely, Jake. Um, good question. They, they actually weren't weirded out because uh, when I was talking about that weird sort of scenario, that was me in post-production. And what we did is we actually, we did overlay some images at that point where it would seem really dissonant and jarring for somebody to be going, yes, and the village died, you know, so, so that the students didn't see that. Some students actually found it um, boring um, or a bit monotone in places. And some students said, oh, look, it was sort of okay, but I wouldn't want to have all of my lectures delivered in that way. And so it really posed to us the, um, the question, well, you know, we probably should just be moving away from the idea of lecturing as well. Like you would, you know, why would you do an hour lecture in, you know, in an avatar? You just wouldn't do that. Uh, it would be very boring, very dull. A um, uh, question from Greg there. Did you look uh, into any technology to map a voice to an avatar? Or map and augment the voice. Well, I was just like, I was thinking, mm -hmm. so you, you mentioned there about, you know, how you had to keep changing the script and putting commas in or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. Like, is, I mean, I'm just curious, is there a way in which you can do that voice recording first and go, I'll do the audio. And then that back maps it from there and augments it. So it doesn't sound like me, but sounds like someone else with another, with another face. Perhaps. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you could, because it's, it's text to video. It could be probably voice to video. Um, I'm not sure like what the license limitations were and mm -hmm. you know what the workarounds in the in the background were that. Um, we were we were starting small. We sort of have a limited license with them. 
and we're thinking we'll scale up if uh, if there's a, a a use case for it really um it's sort of we're seeing it it's not really a replacement for traditional filming uh, we're sort of hmm. complement using it to complement where it makes sense so um in some cases I'm thinking uh it could be like good for example if you're doing a library a library demo or something because obviously that might be updated quite frequently and then it would be very easy just to update the script and pop it out again um yeah. so that kind of thing and I think that's where businesses are looking at it too if you go on to those synthesia websites and so on there there is a lot there about educational use of it but it's like you know training uses yeah so what else is in so there might be more like a vtuber using live mocap and voice performance maybe i mean i guess uh, i can forward some of these questions to boyd who's more technical than i am and did more of the the background scenes but basically we just um saw it as an opportunity to work with academics in in a format they felt comfortable with which was text mm. Mm. and to really um you know we had to do something to that text in order to make it um you know sound good i guess and just to sort of take it from there i've sort of got lots of ideas for future projects but it you know it's, it's early days yet i guess all right just noticing we're out time um so please people if you are do have further questions feel free to um continue the conversation in the televisors team site I'd like to thank uh, Carmen and Greg very much for this session it's been fantastic as I kind of expected it might be um and I will um turn off the recording so thanks again and just show your appreciation in the chat and reacts and all of the various tools that are available <laughs>